Yeah, that's better, I think. Oh, looks like we have about three minutes. Okay, it's seven o'clock. <clears throat> okay, well, it's seven o'clock, so we'd like to welcome everyone who's uh, online tonight for Bible study. Uh, it's certainly a wonderful blessing to be able to get together on Wednesday nights and do this. Um, first, uh, let's bow our heads and we'll ask uh, a blessing on the evening. Our eternal great God, we thank you so much for the many comforts you give to us in your scriptures and the hope we have for the future. Help us to keep mindful that, that we are sojourners that we are looking for a city that has foundations and is currently being built, that we want to be a part of, 
and looking for a better time on the earth than what mankind has been able to produce under Satan's rule. So we thank you for this evening and the wonderful word you've given to us as we study this uh, very important year in Bible history. We ask for your help in understanding how it applies to us and certainly giving us hope for the future. So we thank you now for all these things and we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. I'm going to begin the night just by reading a few verses out of Psalm 37. Um, it's one of my favorite Psalms. And considering the challenging times in which we live, I think it's good for us to review these concepts. Verse 7 says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Wait patiently. In our daytime Bible study yesterday, we discussed the concept of patience and the godly character, quality of patience, and how important it is for us. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Don't be frustrated by evil and others who prosper in their way. You can see, obviously, they're not following God. Because the man who brings wicked schemes to pass, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. So a big challenge not to be upset, not to be emotionally, uh, let's just say, tied up in current events that are very challenging, very disappointing sometimes. It says, evildoers shall be cut off in verse 9. But those who wait on the Lord, meaning again, patience, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. There will be a time, a little, a little while longer, and the wicked will be no more. The earth will be ruled in righteousness. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, and it shall be no more. And the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So that's verse 11 of Psalm 37, very encouraging verse, and the one I hope we can uh, kind of set to memory, whether specifically or in concept. So tonight we are going to start or discuss the events of a very important year, a pivotal year in all history. The events of this year flow down to us today. We are still living some of the results of the events of that year, and in fact, uh, until Jesus Christ returns and the breach is healed, uh, we're going to be going to be seeing some of these things play out. And certainly as we understand the truth about the Israel history, who Israel is and the nations today, uh, this is very important. So the year we're looking at is 931 B.C., 931 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. We'll take up where we left off last time in the book of First Kings, chapter 11. And this year, as you know, was the year when um, King Solomon died and his kingdom was divided, 10 tribes being given to a man named Jeroboam that we'll talk about, and then Judah and, and, and Benjamin along with him. But then many of Levi came back from all of Israel because they were so disgusted and could not abide the religion that Jeroboam was instituting. And so you really have most of the Levites who also joined with Judah and Benjamin and became known as the Southern Kingdom or Judah. In 1 Kings chapter 11, in verse 9, <coughs> excuse me, it says, The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared to him twice. And he commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord had commanded him. He says, therefore, the Lord said, Solomon, for as much as this is done of you, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes. Now, if you look at all the history of the kings of Israel, an interesting study when you read about each one is to try to figure out which one of the direct instructions to kings they violated because God had a number of them in the book of Deuteronomy uh, and also in in, uh, in in Numbers and Exodus, the things that the kings were supposed to do and not to do. And of course, intermarrying with foreign women was one they were prohibited from doing. Solomon violated that also with making these arrangements or uh, military alliances with foreign nations, meaning they would rely on these foreign governments, not on God's protection uh, for their military success. So God said, well, you've, you've simply... Uh, disobeyed me. He says, therefore, I will rend the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Now, this is an insult to give the kingdom to a servant, not somebody who is royal born or who is a, has any sort of right, you might say, by birth to be a king. But instead, this kingdom, those 10 tribes were to be given to a servant. And Jeroboam was indeed a servant in the house of Solomon. Now, the throne stayed with Judah. 
And those who sat on the throne were direct descendants and still are of King David. But the kingdom, the 10 tribes, the vast majority of the people and land were given to a servant, which is a essentially a kind of a curse. He says, how be it, I will not rend it all the way, but will give one tribe to your son for David, my servant's sake. So God was going to keep his promise to David no matter what. And for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. So God chose Jerusalem. God chose the, the, the King David and his family to sit on the throne, and that would not change. Now, the next part of 1 Kings chapter 11, we have the three thorns in the flesh, or the three trials, you might say, that God stirred up, hoping that Solomon would repent. There's a strong biblical principle that God tries us three times. He gives us three trials in order to test our character. Remember, Christ three times Satan tempted him. Uh, Peter denied Christ three times and then three times had to uh, had to apologize for that, essentially. Um, and many, many other examples of, of God's servants being tried three times throughout the scriptures. So the first one was verse 14. The Lord stirred up the adversary and adversary of the Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. Hadad had gone down to Egypt uh, when King, uh, King David had conquered Edom. Now he had grown big. He had married into the royal family. And so he decided to get an army. And when he heard that David was dead, to try to attack um, Solomon. So Hadad was the first. Also, verse 22, then, or verse 23, we'll kind of skip some of the details here for sake of time. God stirred up another adversary, Rezon, the son of Eldadad, which fled from his lord Hadezer, king and of Zoah. So these are neighboring pretty much lands to the south, what we would call Arabia or southern Jordan today. And he gathered unto men a band, um, and of course, uh, he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon. So here we have this second army of enemies on the border that were constantly harassing uh, Solomon during the last half of his of his uh, rulership. Now the third, verse twenty six, is the uh, is the one we really need to be focusing on. That's Jeroboam. So Jeroboam's first calling from God, so to speak, was to try to get Solomon to repent, to try to uh, be an irritation to him, a warning to him. They say, hey, look, God is not protecting you now. You need to need to change. Although those were not Jeroboam's words. Those are simply the lessons Solomon should have learned. So verse 26, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zerida, Solomon's servant. So he was not of Judah. He was of Ephraim, and he was of Zerida, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman. So he basically didn't have a father that we know of. He just simply had um, he just had this woman, a mother that he grew up with. Now, Dake's commentary says this is the third Satan adversary stirred up against Solomon. And this was Jeroboam. He was an Israelite. Solomon had made him ruler, all of those from Ephraim and Asa, who helped him build Milo and repair the breaches of the city of David. So Solomon rebuilt not only the temple, or built the temple and also built a great palace, probably greatly increased the size and the quality of David's palace. But he also built what was called the Milo, M-I-L-L-O. Now that was probably the highest point in the city of David, which was kind of on this Southern ridge going down from the Temple Mount and probably the highest point there. It was kind of like the place where it would be the military tower, the military place of defense. Um, some say it may also have been the location of the palace of the king. Now, we don't know that for sure, but we know that Jeroboam had something to do with helping build it, and he also was unhappy with some of the things that were done, uh, because later it says because of Milo was one reason why he uh, was uh, upset with, uh, like that. that's the next verse. We'll read that, but first, Jeroboam received a prophecy that he was to be king over the ten tribes, which would separate Judah and Benjamin. When Solomon heard of it, he sought to kill him. Notice he didn't seek to repent <laughs> and ask God's forgiveness and guidance. Instead, he sought to kill Jeroboam. And then he fled to Egypt until Solomon's death. So verse 27, this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. So there was something in the building of that tower at Milo at this high point on the city of David that caused offense to Jeroboam. And what it was, we, we don't know. This is the only record we have of it. 
But certainly Jeroboam was a, a very ambitious and also a very uh, talented individual. Um, his, his abilities were recognized by Solomon. That's why he was put in that position. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. So he was quite the soldier, quite the warrior. And Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. So this may have been a big mistake because Jeroboam then became the leader of the 10 tribes by the appointment of Solomon. And so when it was time to break the, break the two in half because of Solomon's sin, then the people of Israel all knew Jeroboam, and perhaps he was a very able administrator and knew how to organize, you know, organize commerce and organize roads and systems of trade or whatever. But he was sort of like the governor of Ephraim and Manasseh uh, while Solomon was still alive. It came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shiloh, Shilonite, so he's from Shiloh, found him on the way where he had clad himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. So we have this uh, prophet named Ahijah. Um, we don't know much more about him other than that, uh, Ahijah the Shilohite. And it says here that, um, that he was wearing uh, that uh, he was wearing a brand new garment. So Jeroboam had some new clothing on, and he, Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And said to Jeroboam, take these 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to you. So this was probably a surprise to Jeroboam. But um, looking at, at what happened after the split occurred, uh, he had thought about it a lot. And he had plans all laid out as to what he was going to do. Verse 32, but he shall save one tribe for my servant David's sake. And for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of the tribes of Israel. And he says, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon. Uh, those are the ones that Solomon's many wives introduced and into Israel and got Solomon and others to worship them. Verse 34, however, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him Prince, all the days of his life for David, my servant's sake, whom I chose, because he, meaning David, kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it unto you, even ten tribes. So the Ephraim and Manasseh, the northern ten tribes, are called the kingdom. It's not called the throne. It's called the kingdom. Verse 36 Unto his son I will give one tribe, and David my servant shall have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen. So David is David's throne here is being guaranteed in Jerusalem. I will take you, and you shall reign according to all that your soul desires, and shall be king afterwards. Now, the message from Ahijah, from God to Jeroboam, fell on very deaf ears. It shall be if you will hearken unto all that I command you and will walk in my ways, which is exactly the opposite of what Jeroboam did, that I will and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I'll be with you and build a, a, you a sure house as I built for David and will give Israel unto you. But I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. So we find what actually happened is Jeroboam became king and then we'll see that he, is, uh, he had a curse where God said he would not only wipe his family out, but he would even uh, later would be an altar that would be completely destroyed uh, that he had set up. Now let's go back to Rehoboam, because we want to talk about Rehoboam. First, we'll take these two men uh, basically um, one at a time in a little bit different, a little bit different sequence, because uh, Rehoboam is first, and Rehoboam is the one who, is, was the actual son of Solomon. In fact, he was probably Solomon's firstborn son. Uh, he was um, probably born when Solomon was about 19, maybe 18, before Solomon became king. Um, let's go down to chapter 12 and verse 1. Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel who were come to Shechem to make him king. So on the death of Solomon, what's interesting is the people did not come to Jerusalem to anoint a new king or to proclaim this new king. 
they came to Shechem, which was up in the area of Ephraim. It was north and a little bit east of Jerusalem. And so Shechem had been uh, the place, of course, of Jacob's well. It was a uh, long time historical, um, historically important place. Um, it was a judicious uh, step, perhaps, by Jeroboam, because he sought to uh, cement, um, I mean, you know, sort of make it up to the 10 tribes, try to make sure they understood him and that he was going to be their king. But the Shechem lay on the flank of Mount Gerizim and between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Um, it was a national sanctuary, so to speak. And it was uh, the site of Abraham's first altar being set up in the Holy Land. So historically, it was very, very important. So they went to Shechem and all Israel came to Shechem to meet him there. And they probably thousands, maybe, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of people on these hills around, uh, around Shechem. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it. For he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. So when Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam after hearing of the prophecy of Ahijah, Jeroboam had wisely beat it out of town and went down to Egypt for protection. So they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spoke unto Rehoboam, saying, now this is an important detail that often is missed. The leader here of this massive group of malcontents was Jeroboam, okay? They knew him, and so he came back from Egypt as fast as he could, and when they have these complaints about ta taxes and threats, Jeroboam is the one leading the movement. So he's sort of the insurrectionist leader. So Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, you make, make you grievous service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve you. So Jeroboam may have known that that wasn't going to happen. No doubt he knew Rehoboam very well because Rehoboam was in the house growing up with, with Solomon, obviously, for 41 years he was there, and Jeroboam had been... In the, in the household of Solomon as a, as a servant and then later as a military and a government uh, person. But he went to ask the, 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 uh, the question is, are you going to lower our taxes or make them higher? Now, today we have a longstanding habit of electing people who make our taxes higher. We seem to be happy with it, but, you know, that's the way it is. Anyway, he said, verse 5, Depart yet for three days, and come again to me. And the people departed. And Rehoboam consulted with the older men. So the first thing he did was consult with the older men of Solomon's advisors. He probably had a court of advisors like most kings do. The men that had stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, and said, how do you advise me that I may answer this, this people? Now, the answer should have been obvious. The temple was built. The city of Jerusalem was built. Uh, if they were to follow God, they would have no wars. They would not have to have taxes for wars. So he probably could have very easily have lowered their taxes and, you know, gotten by with a, you might say, a slimmer, trimmer government. But of course, uh, that's not what happened. He spoke unto him saying, if you will be a servant unto this people this day, or they spoke unto him saying, then answer them and speak good words to them and they'll be your servants forever. So their answer was try to make friends with them, try to ameliorate them, uh, try to uh, basically, you know, make their fears go away that you're going to raise their taxes. Tell them you're going to be a good and kind and just administrator. But he forsook the counsel of the old men. So he didn't listen to the older guys. Now he was in his forties, probably 40, 41 years old, maybe 42. And he listened to the younger ones uh, he consulted with the young men that were grown up with him. So these guys would have been in their 30s. There's not 18-year-olds or 12-year-olds, as, as some mistakenly uh, think of, uh, which stood before him. So he grew up with a crowd of spoiled brats in the, uh, in the palace, let's just be honest. And the crowd of spoiled brats was the ones he asked for advice. And he said to them, what counsel will you give me to answer this people? Now, instead of accepting the wise advice, he took the bad advice. And verse 10, the young men that were grown up with him spoken to him saying, thus you shall speak unto this people that spoken to you saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter. Thus you shall say to them, my father or my little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. So here we have um, a sad case here, just a real sad case. 
Uh, God may have been behind it. Obviously, he was because he wanted the 10 tribes and the to be broken off so that generations later, many generations, the blessings of Abraham uh, the, of the birthright could be bestowed upon them as they were in 1800, but beginning about 1800. So let me read a comment here. Jeroboam was the head of the people who were seeking easier terms with the new king. He was ready to lead his people in rebellion if the answer was not as they had wished. Had it been right, he had no doubt would have become disarmed and cooperated with the king. So God foresaw these events, and these things came to pass as God had predicted. So <clears throat> verse 11, whereas he said, my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, I will chastise you with scorpions, so I'll make life a lot more miserable and difficult for you. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, come again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly. So instead of being nice and trying to ingratiate them and trying to be courteous, instead, he spoke roughly to them. He forsook the old men's counsel and spoke to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy. I will add to your yoke and make my whips like scorpions. So here we have a very, very bad, <laughs> uh, bad decision, bad advice. Verse 15, therefore, the king hearkened not unto the people for the cause was from the Lord that he might perform his saying, which the Lord had spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So God was the working force behind this to bring to pass what his will was. Verse 16, so when all Israel, meaning the 12 tribes, saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king saying, what portion have we in David? So the 10 tribes to the north said, well, why are we even then connected with the throat of David. And the, in this case, the son of David, Rehoboam. Neither have we inheritance in the, to the son of Jesse, to your tents, O Israel. So now, uh, now see to your own house. So the Israel departed for or into their tents. So they all went basically back to where they were camping and started to pack up and go home. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. And the king Rehoboam sent Adahoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones. So he sent a tax collector to try to collect taxes from these 10 tribes to the north and did not turn out so well. He was stoned that he died. Therefore, the king Rehoboam made speed to get up into the ch in his chariot, and he fled to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And so that is true even unto this day. And the one or two times uh, in the books of Kings and Chronicles when the king of Israel and Judah sort of made up and were considering reuniting. Um, God made sure that did not happen because his promise was to Abraham uh, twofold and the scepter never departed from Judah, never has, but the birthright promise was Joseph's. And so the birthright promise blessing had to be given to Joseph, not Judah. And for that to happen, they had to be separate nations. Well, let's just continue on down here a little bit farther to see what, what transpires. The first thing is, is it looked like it was going to be a war and God had to call off the war. Verse 21, when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, a hundred and fourth score thousand chosen men, which were warriors. So 180,000 soldiers, very, very large army to fight against the house of Israel to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So this civil war, he said, we're going to force them to become under the throne of David or Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, now, Shemaiah um, is a kind of a hard guy to pin down. There are 23 different Shemaiahs mentioned in the Bible. So it's kind of like Mary's in the gospel. So I'll make it was only six Mary's, but I'm just guessing it's hard to tell. But Shemaiah, there's a lot of them. In this case, it's simply a prophet, a man of God that was recognized named Shemaiah. Saying, speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin. So Judah and Benjamin were still there in Jerusalem. In fact, the city of Jerusalem, that land technically is Benjamin. It's not Judah. Judah's to the south. So Judah was the smallest of the tribes, had the smallest amount of territory allocated to it under Joshua. And the city of Jerusalem was located in the land of Benjamin, not in the land of Judah. So the Temple Mount, essentially the temple belongs 
in the land of Benjamin. Now, <clears throat> the Lord said, you shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel, return every man to his own house. And notice this last half of the sentence in verse 24. For this thing is from me. God takes credit for this split. This thing is from me. They hearken therefore to the, to the word of the Lord and return to depart according to the word of the Lord. Now, just as a sidelight comment that might not be worth anything, perhaps not every split in the church has been man-made or Satan-inspired. Perhaps God wanted some of the splits in order to find out the character of certain people, of his people. Um, don't know that for sure. God will have to tell us someday. Uh, but certainly these times and trials and these uh, all the various factions and splits that have gone on since the day the church was founded, uh, there is some purpose served. That purpose, of course, is God testing our character. But God said very plainly, this split is for me. And maybe uh, maybe it was not the only split that was inspired by God for his purpose that was very difficult for people who were involved in it at the time to understand. Let's continue on. Verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out from thence and built Penuel. Now, what Jeroboam is doing here is very quickly taking over. Um, he was never crowned king. He was just sort of agreed that this, this guy is going to lead us. But Jeroboam built Shechem, which was, of course, where the, the split had taken place. He, what, when it says he built Shechem, what it means is he built a fortress. He built you know, walls and a tower and tried to build a militarily defensive place. He also built one in Penuel, and he begins to, uh, you know, begins to try to solidify himself. And he's building this border because he does not want the people, the 10 tribes up north, migrating down to Jerusalem to give sacrifices and to worship. He knew he would lose control of them if he did that. So we have Rehoboam. And I want to go and look at something else. Uh, we might hold our place here. Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 11. So let's just go over to Second Chronicles chapter 11. Um, we have a little different story here, a little, little different sidelight about the, uh, the government of Rehoboam and what kind of king or what kind of governor he was. Verse 1 of Second Chronicles chapter 11. Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem. He gathered the house of Judah and Benjamin, so Judah and Benjamin, 104 score thousand chosen men, which were warriors. That's this army he gathered to fight Israel, to bring them back, that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, speak to Rehoboam, tell him not to do that. And, of course, we've covered that. Now, verse 5, Rehoboam dwelled in Jerusalem and built cities for defense of Judah. He built Bethlehem, Etam, Tekoa, uh, Belshur, Seco, Adul. Now, these cities are to the south. So Rehoboam realizes that the Egyptians are his most likely enemy. So he begins to build this circle of fortresses, these cities that he put men in, put soldiers in, and also reinforced uh, all down towards the south. And it goes all the way from Hajalon, Hebron, which are in Judah, and Benjamin, fenced cities, which means walled cities, walls of some kinds. And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them. So he put soldiers with captains in them and store of victuals. So they stored up food. So if they were under siege, uh, they could sustain themselves for months uh, on end. And oil and wine. In every several city, he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. So Jehor uh, Jeroboam, I'm sorry, uh, Rehoboam, is a pretty sharp guy too. These are two fairly smart individuals, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And they both get their act together and try to solidify their kingdoms pretty quickly, pretty quickly. Verse 13, the priests and the Levites that were at all Israel resorted to him out of their coasts. So the priests and the Levites, because of the sins of Jeroboam and the false religion of Jeroboam we'll read about, began to migrate back to Jerusalem and join with Rehoboam's kingdom in Judah and Benjamin. He or, and he ordained priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. Uh, this is um, 
one of you know Rehoboam's getting himself into real trouble here. I'm sorry for Jer- uh, Jeroboam. Verse 14. The Levites left their suburbs because Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office and ordained essentially evil men to be priests. So verse 14 of chapter 11, uh, Second Chronicles tells us that the Levites came back to J- Jerusalem because of Jeroboam instituting false religion. Now, verse 16, and after that, them out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. And they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong. Three years, for three years, they walked in the way of David and Solomon. So the first three years of Rehoboam's kingdom, he was actually getting stronger and he was actually uh, getting people migrating back, although the vast majority of the northern 10 tribes you know, stayed up north in their homeland. Now, then we have family nepotism, family nepotism here by Rehoboam. Verse 16, Rehoboam took Mahalath, the daughter of Jeremoth, son of David, to wife, so he married one of his cousins. And Abihail, the daughter of Eliab, the son of Jesse, so a second cousin, maybe a third cousin, I think second cousin, which bare him children, Jehosh, Shamariah, and Zahram. And after he took Metmachah, daughter of Absalom, so that would also be a, uh, oh, essentially that would be a cousin, probably a second cousin to him, which she bare him Abijah, Atai, Ziza, and Shemelith, uh, maybe a first cousin, I'm not quite sure how this, I'll do, do a family chart someday. And Rehoboam loved Makkah, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines. For he took 18 wives and threescore concubines. Now, he's simply repeating the sin of his father. Um, his father had hundreds of wives and concubines, which were wives, but they simply did not have any legal inheritance rights. And so we have, um, we have the son here following the very poor example of his father, and he probably should have thought about, you know, my dad got himself in big trouble doing this. Maybe I shouldn't do this. But since he was king, he felt he had the right. Uh, So anyway, verse 22, it says he had uh, 20 uh, and eight sons and three score daughters. So 28 sons and 60 daughters. Uh, He obviously um, had a lot of children. And Rehoboam made Ahijah, the son of Makkah, the chief, to be ruler among his brethren. For he thought to make him king, and he dealt wisely and dispersed of all his children throughout all the countries of Judah and Benjamin. So we had lots of children, lots of relatives. This, you know, David had a large family, lots of kids. And so he placed all his relatives in all these cities around Jerusalem and, and the, the town, the, the landmass of Judah and, and Benjamin, uh, basically to make sure there's always somebody there who was loyal to him. He was not going to have any more of this Jeroboam type rebellion going on. So notice it says here, he gave them food in abundance and he desired many wives, which of course was one reason he became an apostate because he, uh, chapter 12 and verse one says, it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And of course, then Egypt invades, and we have uh, some kind of a sad story here, sad uh, continuation as to what happened uh, What happened to him. So the commentary says that uh, he was a, a lover of good things and had a considerable harem and followed in, the, uh, followed in the sins of his father. Now let's go back to 1 Kings, uh, back to 1 Kings where we have a much more detailed story. And more information about it. First Kings. <clears throat> Let's begin. I think now we can drop down to. Uh, yeah, drop down to verse 28. Well, here we have. Let's uh, actually that, that's over in Jeroboam's time. But let's let's. Um, yeah, I think we I think we will have time to cover that under, under Jeroboam. So let's go over to Kings. First Kings 13. I'm sorry. Let's go to 14. 14 and verse 21, because I want to have plenty. I want to have some time for Jeroboam and what he did. So 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 21. It came to pass when they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried to the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, 
for as much of you as you have disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and have not kept commandment, which the Lord your God gave you. But you came back and eat water and drank bread. So this is this prophet that had been given this job to do and sadly had failed. Uh, that's in chapter 13. But in chapter 14, um, let's go back over to skip over there. Uh, chapter 14 and verse 21. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign. So Solomon died at about age 60, meaning that uh, would have been about 19, 18 years old when his first son, Rehoboam, was born. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, so he didn't reign all that long. He was 41 when he began to reign, 17 years. He was 58 when he died. So the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there, and his mother's name was Nama and Ammonitus. So we have here Rehoboam, who was uh, the son of an Ammonite um, over to modern-day Jordan, uh, who, but his father was Solomon, so he had the right to become the king. Notice, Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers have done. So Jeroboam, I mean Rehoboam, led the people of Judah into idolatry and sin. It says they also built high places, so places on hilltops so they could worship the rising sun, and images and groves, so they had statues, they had images of Baal or, or other false gods. Actually, Baal isn't mentioned here as much as Ashtoreth and some of the others, Moloch. And it says, there were also sodomites in the land, according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So under Rehoboam, um, they had a gay rights movement, so to speak, and all of the sins listed in Leviticus 18 were practiced and apparently openly, or at least uh, come in an approved form. And of course, that caused then uh, God to send an enemy army into them. Verse 25, it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. So God allowed him five years before sending in the king of Egypt to try to basically bring him back to his senses or make him repent. Uh, historians record that this army that Shishak brought was very large. Um, apparently several you know, 100,000 men and maybe 30 or 40,000 chariots, who knows. Um, the story is that the account seems to be that um, the gates of Jerusalem were thrown open. Rehoboam basically surrendered without a fight. He knew that if there was a fight, he would lose very quickly. So it simply says that King Shishak of Egypt took away all the treasures of the house of the Lord. One of several times when the treasures of the house of the Lord were stolen or taken. And the measure and the treasures of the king's house and took away all. He took away the shields of gold, which Solomon had made. So basically, King Shishak was bought off. You can have all of our gold, all of our silver, all of our treasure if you just don't destroy our city. So Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed to them the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. So in other words, maybe had a uh, kind of a hostage situation going on there. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard uh, bared them and brought them back into the chamber. Now, verse 29, the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And so there are books about the kings of Judah, historical books that we don't have today. Uh, I'm sure someday we will have access to them, but so far we've not uh, been able to, they've not been discovered. There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days, as verse 30. Well, skirmishes might be a better you know, a, a better word, or there was conflict between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. There was never open war because God told them they could not do that. But here we have Rehoboam and Jeroboam having conflict all of their days. Verse 31, Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Name of the Amoritus, and Abijam, his son, reigned in his stead. We read about Abijam earlier being one who was appointed as the king of a guard. He was the son, the grandson of Absalom, uh, the son of Malcolm, uh, Absalom's daughter, Malcolm, Malka, I think it is. Okay, Jeroboam, we have some time to look at Jeroboam now. Jeroboam was the, the uh, man who became the ruler of the ten tribes of Israel to the north, first at Shechem, 
and later up in Samaria. But interesting, there's a lot in the Bible about Jeroboam. Well, let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 11. We read through some. Let's, let's, start, let's start in verse 12, because basically, or chapter 12. Basically, Jeroboam's story um, encompasses a number of chapters in the Bible. We won't have time to go through them all. Basically, chapter 12 through chapter 14 um, and part of uh, some other chapters. But here we have verse um, 25 of 1 Kings 12. This is called the sin of Jeroboam, uh, who made Israel to sin. So Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein. He went from there and built Penuel. Down in verse 28, the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, to the people of Israel, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. It's just too far of a trip. Behold your gods, O Israel, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, who said that before? Remember Moses' brother Aaron. He made these gold. These, uh, it's over in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 4. When he made the golden calf, how was golden calf introduced to them? And the people of Israel probably all knew this. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 4. Chapter 32 and verse 4, it says, He received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned in it a, in, with an engraving tool, made a molded calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And so the two golden calves, these false calves of Jeroboam, are introduced as, Behold your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So he's simply quoting Aaron. It was a lie when Aaron said it. It was a lie when Jeroboam said it. He said one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now, Bethel had been the place where the tabernacle had been set up for a while. So this Bethel means house of God. So it was a very, it was a, um, it was an abominable thing to do. Now up in Dan, the tribe of Dan was to the far north, up to the land of uh, what is today Lebanon, uh, Mount Hermon. And they have found and reconstructed this um, this tabernacle, uh, tabernacle, this altar of Jeroboam, um, we were able to see it a number of years ago. We were there. Um, it's been reconstructed in about the last 15 years. Uh, you can see pictures of it. If you Google it on, on uh, a search engine, uh, you will find the altar of Jeroboam at Dan. It's very interesting the way they've done it. They've kind of rebuilt a metal altar about the same size. Uh, but they, uh, the, the archaeologists are very, very certain this is the one. So it is the actual place. And there are little houses for the priests, the false priests, of course, there. And they were basins for sacrificing animals and various things. So he made these false gods. He announced to the people of Israel a lie that it was these calves that had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. And he said, one in Bethel, one in Dan. This thing became a sin for the people went to worship before one, even unto Dan. And so he knew that if they went to Jerusalem and kept the feast days, Passover, unleavened bread, also Feast of Tabernacles, Pentecost, that they would be drawn back into the true worship of God in Jerusalem because God's holy days do that. They cause you to worship the true God in the right way. So what did he have to do? He had to also change the days that were worshiped on. It said he made a house of high places and he made priests of the lowest of the people, not the priests that were descended from Levi or from Aaron. He made priests of the lowest of the people. People just appointed themselves to be the priests of God, just like they do today, uh, which are not the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month. So he ordained a feast, not in the seventh month, as God had ordained, but in the eighth. He would do it a, a month later. He probably said, oh, look, you people, you don't need to leave when you've just harvested your crops. You don't have time to do your canning and your drying and putting them on. I'm sure he appealed to their uh, you know, sense of needing to be treated nice or something. And so he said, let's just do it in the eighth month instead of in the uh, seventh month. And there are calendar experts today that are constantly uh, trying to get people to keep the feast, God appointed feast a month later, uh, way in November, uh, just like Jeroboam did. And they were, they're as wrong, just as wrong as Jeroboam was. So like into the feast that is in Judah. So it was like the feast in Jerusalem, but it wasn't. It was a different feast. 
and he offered up on the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. He offered up on the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the eighth month, the 15th day of the eighth, not the seventh, of the eighth month and the seventh which he had devised in his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So this was an abomination doing it at Bethel, and it was a bold-faced lie and a deceit doing it in the wrong month. Now, chapter 13 shows that God then says, your family is not going to rule. You're going to be the last one or pretty close to it. And this altar, which is an abomination to me, is going to be demolished. So chapter 13 Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah. Notice, he didn't come out of Israel. He came out of Judah, this man of God. By the word of the Lord, he came to Bethel. That's where this altar of this one of these golden calves was. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So it just happened to be Jeroboam's out there with his morning incense burning. And he cried against the altar in the word of, in the, word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon you he shall offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon you, and men's bones shall be burnt upon you. In other words, shall be completely destroyed. And of course, uh, having people burned onto it would be defiled, never been able to be used again. Now, how many years later did this take place? 322 years before Josiah was born, and about 348 before this prophecy was fulfilled. So God is patient, more than we are, but 348 years before this occurred, God predicted through this prophet that this is exactly what is going to happen. And of course, it did happen. Now, as a sign that God's word was true, and that this was going to happen, and perhaps as a one last chance for Jeroboam to repent. There were three miracles done. He gave a sign in the same day, saying, Behold, this is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. So this altar is going to be destroyed, and whatever ashes on it are going to be thrown out. It came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand. He said, lay hold on him. He gave, he gave his men orders and pointed at this prophet and said, you know, go grab him and kill him. And so what did God do? His hand, which he put forth against him, dried up. So he could not pull it up against him. So his hand turned into a stick, basically. He just withered up and he couldn't move. And so he walked around with his hand that's essentially like, like a baseball bat stuck to him. And the altar also was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So here's these two miracles. First is Jeroboam's arm turning into a stick and the altar being torn in half and ashes being poured out. Notice the king's reaction. He's not quite so arrogant, not quite so <clears throat> full of himself in verse 6. It says, The king answered and said to the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord your God, not my God, but the Lord your God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me again. Evil people always are concerned with the penalty being removed. They're not concerned about changing their behavior, repenting, or getting really forgiveness. All they're concerned with is getting avoiding the penalty. That's the way it is. That's the way most prisoners are today. That's the way most uh, people who get caught in sexual sins of some kind, especially pedophiles or ra rapists, abusers, uh, their only concern is how do I get out of the penalty? So Jeroboam did that. And of course, the man of God uh, besought the Lord. He asked God to do it because that would be another miracle that would then show that God was behind this. And he was restored to him again. And he was as it was before. Now, the king then said to the man of God, come home with me and refresh yourself. And I will give you a reward. Uh, the man of God said, I'm sorry, um, I will not go with you, on, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place, for it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread nor drink water, nor turn again, again by the same way, but turn again, or turn away by the same way you came, but take another way. So there's a couple of New Testament principles that I think we need to look at here. The first is in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. This 
man of God. Um, unfortunately, he had a weakness in his character that caused him to go back on this promise. But at this point, he understood it, and he gave the correct answer. So Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, <clears throat> Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So God doesn't want us to go out and celebrate pagan holidays and pretend that it's okay. Uh, God doesn't want us to go out and participate in sinful activities and then uh, say, well, you know, I really didn't get affected by it or whatever, whatever excuse we want to use. He says, but rather expose it. Whether they say, no, that is wrong. Uh, we don't want to do that. God says we shan't. We shan't. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which were done are done by them in secret. So we are not to participate in other men's sins, as it says very plainly in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22, and we're not to have fellowship with 